looking at uh, an interaction in the Bible uh, between this man, uh, this, this prophet named Samuel, and uh, this man named Jesse and his sons. Uh, and we're going to turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's, if you're reading from your fresh Bibles, it's page number 172. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I put my wallet somewhere. This is driving me nuts. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 16, and, and while you turn there, let me give you some background knowledge on, on a little bit of what's happening uh, in, 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 the, in the time that we're reading this. So um, you've got this, this kingdom of Israel, right? You've got this, this, these people of God. People of God is, are the Israelites, and, and for, for a long time now, they've, a little bit, I guess, in relative, uh, probably 400 years, um, they've been in this promised land. You've heard of the promised land. Moses took his people out, and they went to go to the promised land, but they ended up the one, anyways, but um, they so so they 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 finally inherited the promised land uh, that they have been so desperately trying to get to over this over this you know this really really long amount of time, and so God is so ingenious in the way that He designs things. Instead of having a king, He decides to have judges, and this word gets a little confusing because we we try to mix it with today's word, what we think of judges and, and everything like that. And they did a little bit of that, but it was more so, think of it as a leader. So they had these different leaders set up, and God would appoint these leaders for a certain amount of time, and then it would be time to move on. Well, the people of Israel, they were surrounded by these other nations, these other uh, nations that had kings and, and, and queens and, and every, you know, like the, the kingdom structure, right? <clears throat> and the, the people of Israel were like a little jealous. and like, well, well hang, on, hang on a second. Why... I mean, I, I want a king that I can see. I want a leader that I can see. I mean, I know like we all follow God or whatever, you know, and the book of Judges says that uh, because there was no king, they kind of did what was right in their own eyes, which ultimately will lead you to uh, just a terrible path of destruction. The, the Old Testament's great uh, if you want to feel better about yourself because these people were really, just really bad. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so, so the people of Israel are like, we want our own king too. They're begging God, and they're, they're begging the prophets, and finally God's like, look, it's not a good idea, but fine. You'll, you'll learn eventually, and so that's what they do, and they appoint this man named Saul, and not to be confused with the Saul that turned into Paul. That's in the New Testament. This is just King Saul. He, he has the same name his whole life, um, and so, so Saul is this king, and, and he was anointed and appointed by God to be the king of, of Israel, even though God didn't really want to at the time, but he said, that's fine. If you're begging for it, then that's fine. And uh, so, so Saul was, was an imperfect person. They went from having a perfect king, God, to an imperfect king, man, and ultimately, that's, that's going to, uh, it's going to show its true colors, and that's exactly what happens, and Saul is a people pleaser, which I can relate, and he he was he um, he liked the praise of man more than he liked the praise of God. He liked the honor of man more than he liked the honor of God and the reverence of God. So so ultimately he failed, and, and God was like, you know what? It's time to appoint a new king. I told you this guy wasn't going to work out, and so he's talking to his prophet Samuel, and Samuel and, and he's telling Samuel, hey, go to this guy, and he's going to be the new king. And so this is kind of the interaction of, of what's happening, and it's a little confusing if we just dive in. So I figured we would give some some context here and. And so, so we'll dive into to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll read all the way to verse 13. Just a, just a short passage of scripture today, and uh, let's see what we can gather from it. So this starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse, and find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Samuel asked, how can I do that? If, if Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. Again, Saul, not really a good guy at this point. Um, and, and God says, take a heifer with you, which is a, a small you know, baby cow. And the Lord replied, and, and then say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I, I will show you which one of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed, and when he arrived to Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Because a lot of the time, if you were in a town and a prophet came to you, it's either really good news or really bad news. So people are kind of on the edge right now. You know, what's wrong? Do you come in peace? And in verse 5, yes, Samuel replied, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one of the Oh, I'm sorry, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, mm, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. 
The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's a good word right there. Verse 8, then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. And Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemaiah, but Samuel said, neither is this one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel asked, are are these all the sons that you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Like, it's, he's, it's not a big deal. It's just this, the young, the young kid. But Samuel said, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes like me. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> and the Lord said, and the Lord said to Samuel, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil, olive oil that he had, and he brought, and he anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on, and Samuel returned to Ramah. So David is the young kid in this story. David, David is the one who's out in the fields tending to the sheep, not even as important enough to invite to the, to the king finding, or the king anointing ceremony, you know? And so it's funny, though, because David goes on to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest king that Israel ever did have. And his son, Solomon, who wrote a lot of uh, Ecclesiastes and and Song of Solomon, he he goes on to be uh, one of the wisest and richest kings Israel ever had. And who would have thought that the scrawny ranch hand, the one who wasn't even invited to to the meeting, David, who would have thought that that would be the one that, that would be the one that God has chosen. I want to talk to us uh, today from the idea that, that God often chooses and always uses the least likely to succeed. In fact, that's my sermon title if you're, if you're taking notes today, the least likely to succeed. And help me introduce this a little bit. Turn to your neighbor, elbow him a little bit, and say, hey, you're good for something. <laughs> you're good for something. If God can use David, he can use you. Tell him, encourage him real quick. You're good for something, I guess. <laughs> you're good for something. Hey, let's pray and open this up today. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, God, for your scriptures and and the authors who decided to take the time to write this stuff down so that it can impact us over thousands and thousands of years later. God, we're so grateful that we have such ease of access to this and in bookstores, on our phones, on the internet. Uh, I'm just so grateful that your divine plan uh, worked out to where you knew that we were going to need this word uh, when, it was, when it happened thousands of years ago. So God, we're grateful for this time. I pray you'd speak into us and allow us to take something and, and be different today. Take, take, take something that you say to us and let it change us and let us walk out of here completely different than the way that we came in. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Um, have you ever felt this feeling that David has, uh, where you just you feel ill-equipped, uh, you, you, you feel unprepared, you, you feel like you just, you just don't have the right tools for the job? I used to work in cars. I know what it's like to not have the right tools for the job. It's, it's not fun. Everything is a hammer, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, with all of that, with, with not having, uh, you know, with not being equipped and not ha- being prepared, it comes with this kind of this t- toll that takes on you of not having a whole lot of confidence either. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever been there from a time in our lives? Yeah. Uh, do you remember like probably the first time or the first day of your job that you have now when you got there and maybe you graduated from college and you're like, all right, you know, I'm really ambitious and we're going to get this thing and we're going to do it. And you get to your first day on the job and there's just like so much stuff. And the guy that's showing you around is like, hey, look at all this, look at that, blah, 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 blah. and he's going, and he's like, oh, and <laughs> it's just so overwhelming sometimes. You're like, and you go home on your first day of work, you're like, I am never going to be able to succeed here. I just, I feel like I'm, I'm going to fail at this and they're going to fire me really quick because there's no way I can retain all this information. Um, my first job, I worked at a, a pizza place, um, and I remember the, the guy on my interview, he's like, yeah, I'm going to hire you. I just want to know you a little bit. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I mean, that's cool, I guess, but it kind of told me about his leadership. And um, <clears throat> so I remember my first day, my first, my first day of my first job, I, I worked at this pizza place. I was the cashier. And the manager took maybe three minutes to show me everything that I, everything that I needed to know. 
uh, for, the, for running this cashier position. And so he was just trying to, to get out really quick. I think his shift was ending or he wanted to go take a smoke break, something. He wanted to get out of where he was. And she was like, yeah, this and this, blah, blah, blah. All right, you got it? And I was like, uh, I guess. And not just a minute later, a customer walked in. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I like kind of stood there. I was like, hello. I don't know what to, like, they didn't even teach me the proper greeting. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I just felt so unprepared. And I was like shaking the whole time. I was like, here's your, here's your change, sir. You know, I was freaking out because I, I just didn't like the feeling of being un. Prepared. Um, another time, this is probably the worst time I've ever felt of, of being unprepared, is when my wife gave birth to my son. I had zero clue what was going on at the time. I, <laughs> I was useless completely. I had no, I could offer nothing. I was, you know, and it, it's weird because childbirth makes you say the stupidest things, men. You know what I'm talking about? Makes you say this like, breathe, honey. Obviously, she knows that, right? You know, it's like, I don't, uh, push, you know, it's not time. Oh, sorry. Okay. You know, or, you know, uh, uh, are you doing okay, babe? How you, are you, you look great. And I'm just like saying these stupid things. Cause I don't know what, to, I don't know what to say. You know, and I'm, I'm just so unprepared. No one prepared me for what I was going to experience in the delivery room. Everything, everybody prepared, prepared me sort of what was going to happen, happen after, but the delivery room, that was, that was a nightmare. That was a mess. You know, thank God the nurses and the doctors showed up, and they would know what to do, because certainly if it was up to me, I don't know <laughs> what would have happened. Maybe you, maybe you feel unprepared when it comes to your faith, when it comes to following Jesus. Maybe, maybe, and maybe I'm uh, speaking to you today where you, you feel like, you know, you come into church and you're trying to hide things because you don't want people to know how big of a mess you are. Or maybe you're, you're coming to church and you just, you just don't know what to expect. It's your first time, you're like... I don't know. I mean, the, the music's cool, and, and you know, the, the coffee's good. It's really strong, but I, mean, I don't really know what to expect. I'm, I'm unprepared for this. And then, you know, you, you decide, you're like, hey, you know, this Jesus guy actually does sound pretty cool. I'm going to follow him. And you say you're going to follow him, and then someone hands you this huge book. It's like, all right, poof, here's the rule book. It's like, what? Oh, and by the way, there's 66 books in this book. What? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, oh, but make sure you don't take anything out of context. But you can't read it to cover to cover either, because that just won't make any sense. What? <laughs> so, and it's not like chronological either. So you got to look up the timeline on, on Google or whatever. It's like, man, I, I, I was coming to be encouraged, and sometimes we leave uh, discouraged sometimes because we just don't feel like we ha- are, have it all together. We just don't feel like we're all prepared. We just don't feel like we're, we're, we don't feel like we're equipped enough to take on the task. One of my biggest fears is that I actually have dreams about this, nightmares. I wake up, that I'll come up here, and there's going to be nothing. And I'm going to have to make something up on the spot. That's my biggest fear because I, I, you know, spend uh, hours of preparation to, to going through the scriptures. And I, I, it's like, I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes. But we don't like this feeling of being unprepared. We don't like this feeling of, 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 of being ill-equipped. And, and there's this burden that weighs down on us when we are. And it, and it kills our confidence. It crushes our character. And it, and it really messes with us when we just don't feel like we're enough. We don't feel like we're equipped. We don't feel like we can live up to this task that we've signed up for. And I've I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news for us. And the good news is that God can use you when you feel unprepared, when you feel ill-equipped, and when you feel unqualified. The bad news is that God will use you (laughs) when you feel unprepared, when you feel ill-equipped, and when you feel unqualified. I mean, just, just take a look at David. Take a look at David. You know, <clears throat> David wasn't anybody special. He didn't have like a royal lineage. He wasn't born into kingship. He wasn't in any type of leadership position. He was just a young farmhand who hung out with smelly sheep all day, you know? And I mean, I guess, I guess you, he, he led the sheep, but I mean, leading millions of people versus leading some, some stupid sheep, or, you know, that's, that's a big difference, you know? And well, I guess I have met people that are more stubborn than sheep uh, sometimes. But anyways, so it's, 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 a, it's a daunting task for David, you know. And, and not only was his responsibility to lead the people, but his responsibility to, was to protect the people. See, I don't know, I guess when we think of kings, we think of like, you know, 1,600 kings where they just stay in their palace all day and rule. But back in, back in David's time, kings were warriors. Kings were, were barbarians. They would be out on the front lines leading the people. That's what the kings did. And so this was David's responsibility. This is what he knew he, he was going to have to do, and it's, it's really nothing he signed up for. It's what God chose him to do. And so 
This, he's looking around and this, this land that they promised us, this land God promised us is surrounded by Canaanites and, and, and Tishbites and, and all these other ites and they're all, uh, um, they're all opposing forces to, to our nation, the nation of Israel. And you know, of, of all the people God could have picked, he picked David? He picked the scrawny farmhand, the songwriting shepherd, David? The one with absolutely no experience or qualifications. God chose him. God chose David. Can you imagine the amount of excruciating pressure that David probably has to feel in this point? You know, no qualifications, no training. They didn't have YouTube back then, so it's not like how to be a king. He couldn't do that. They didn't have that, so he had to figure it out on his own. They didn't have online college courses this is all, you know, something you, you, you grow up into. If you're the king, it's because your dad was the king or because you're, uh, you conquered uh, the, the other king. And it was very battle-like, very aggressive, and, and very daunting. And so David, he, he didn't even sign up for this, wouldn't even do this. In fact, his dad didn't even invite him to the meeting. <laughs> and it's funny, the, the Bible says all seven of Jesse's sons when he has eight. <laughs> it's, so he, he already counted them out. And that's got to be a discouraging feeling too when even your dad doesn't think you have a chance of being the king. But not only that, the, 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 the pressure to follow in the footsteps of, of Israel's first and only king, and he messed up? I mean, that's, that's pressure, man. Anytime there's a leadership transition, there's pressure. It's, it's, and it's rarely ever good. Come on, we do this every four years here. When's the last time we had a good one? <laughs> you know what I mean? Never in my life, no, okay, never in my life have I seen such bitterness and such hatred towards a person because of your political, ah, I won't go there. But I'm saying, as Christians, we need to be praying for everybody, even the ones you didn't vote for. I'll just leave that there because we're all a team and we don't want our leaders to fail. Anyways, anyways, so David, get back on track here. David was, was you know, would have been in this leadership transition for people that didn't even know this guy. He didn't grow up in kingship. In fact, Saul had a son. His name was Jonathan. Actually, I looked at the kids' curriculum. Your kids are learning about this today, too, which is kind of very cool. But, but uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, would have been next in line for king. And now David comes out of line and says, hey, it's me. I'm king. That's a, that's a, that's a, big, that's a big deal, you know? And, 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 and so David would have to deal all that, the, the amount of enormous pressure that, that just tells, and the, and the lies that, tell, that he tells himself that I'm just not good enough to do this, I'm not experienced enough to do this, I, I didn't even want to do this, and he even knows he's not the best pick for this. In fact, Samuel was like, all right, it's this brother, it's Eliab. No, it's not Eliab. Well, certainly it's got to be Abinadab. Nope, Shemaiah, nope, all the other seven before he picked David. So even David knows the prophet of God would have judged him differently or would have picked it differently if it was up to him. So, so you know, this, of all, it's inter interesting, of all the viable options of, of people that were willing, available, and, 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 and able to do this, to be the next king, God chose David. God chose the least likely to succeed to become the king of God's people. God chose the least likely to succeed to lead and, 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 and guide God's people. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying I'm perfect, not by any means. And I'm not saying I'm God, but if I was, I don't know, <laughs> I, just, just looking at it, I, looking at the stat sheet, I don't know if, 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 if I would have picked David, honestly. I mean, you know, sometimes I, I, I just look at the Bible and I'm thinking, how in the world, why in the world would God choose some of these people? I mean, if I'm God, right, I want to choose people that are, that are mighty, that, are, that have lots of honor and, and, and influence, because if I'm going to choose someone to represent my kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, certainly it should be someone who is going to represent him well. That's not who God chose. God chose someone like Moses who had a stuttering problem and was really stubborn and was hard to convince sometimes. God chose Peter 
who, who seemed like he had too much Red Bull all the time you read about him in the Bible. He was so eccentric and just wound up like, take a chill, chill pill, dude. He was, you know, ambitious and, and got himself in trouble a lot. His mouth got himself in trouble a lot. It, it's people like Abraham, who's just really old dude without kids. And he's, and, and, and he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll carry the promise of God, whatever, in, in, my, in, my, uh, in my lineage, even though I'm not going to be able to have kids. And he cheated on his wife specifically when God asked him not to, by the way. It, it, God chose someone like Paul, who was the New Testament Saul, who was killing Christians and blaspheming God, bl- or blaspheming Jesus, you know, this is, these are the people that God chose. I'm looking at his track record like, dude, this is, this is not, <laughs> if, if I were you, I would do it differently, man. But then I'm reminded of, of, of what God says to Samuel in verse 7 of our passage. He says this, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Not the muscles, not at the extensive resume, not at their track record. He looks at the, the heart and how the heart can be moldable and, and malleable to come to know him. And because God placed his trust and his anointing on those people, they become some of the greatest heroes of the faith. Moses was one of the greatest leaders of all time. Peter was, uh, he's still eccentric and, you know, still ADHD, but, you know, he became became one of the great pioneers and one of the great pastors of of the the New Testament church and and forwarded the kingdom, forwarded the mission, the kingdom of God. And Abraham had his promised son at 110 years old. That's old. (laughs) He had his son at 110 years old and, and he stayed faithful to his wife even after that. And Paul became one of the great revolutionaries of the church. And we, almost, we attribute almost half of your New Testament to him. Just because God chose uh, people that, that seemed like nobodies and, and he was able to make them somebody. God chose people who seemed like nobodies and turned them into somebody. It was nothing to do with the people and everything to do with the God the people serve. Empowering the people to be used in such a great way that's so much greater than they could have been used on their own. And if I can encourage you today, I want to tell you this. God always uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. God always uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. Why? That's all he's got to choose from. (laughs) So that should be encouraging to me and you to say, oh, There is no such thing as a perfect person. Oh, there is no such thing as a person that has it all together, and God used them too. In fact, you read some of the stories in in the Bible, and you're like, man, I'm actually way better off than this guy is. (laughs) Maybe I do have a chance. Not that we should compare, but you know, take the stories and how they can impact yours. God always chooses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan because that's all he's got to choose from. And if you struggle with the thoughts that you're like, I, I just, I can't be used by God. I'm, I'm not enough. I'll never be enough. I'll never measure up. I've done too many bad things. Maybe I've just done really, one really, really bad thing and I've just never recovered from it. Like I can never get past that. I'm not good enough so I can't be used by God. I don't meet the qualifications. But I want you to know that if you are imperfect, you meet all the qualifications God is looking for. If you are imperfect, and that's everybody in this room, you meet all of the qualifications that God is looking for. You don't have to have experience to be used by God. You don't have to have an elaborate resume to be used by God. God wants to use you right where you are right now. Don't get it twisted, though. God doesn't need you. Oh, no, don't don't let your ego get so big that we think that, that God needs me to do this. God needs me to accomplish X, Y, and Z. No, no, no. Don't, don't let your ego get in the way. God doesn't need us. God wants us. And that should speak something to how we value ourselves. And a lot of the time we, we, we establish our worth and our value dependent on what we do and what we've done. But that God doesn't work that way. Our value is dependent on, our, our value is determined by who God says we are. God doesn't need us. No. He's God. He doesn't need anything. God wants us. God wants you. God wants me. He wants to partner with us and use us to empower our lives to make a difference for his kingdom. He doesn't need us. 
He wants us. God always uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. God chose David, the least likely to be king, and he, become one of, he became one of the greatest kings to ever reign in Israel and Judah. One of the greatest kings. And, and it is interestingly enough, about a thousand years later, Jesus shows up on the scene through the line of David. And it's interesting, too, because as we see this picture of, of God using David and making him king, and he's least likely to be king, we see this prophetic picture in this story where Jesus shows up on the scene, and, and he's not the Messiah everyone thought he might be. He, he didn't seem like he would be the king of kings, lord of lords. He, it seemed like it wasn't good whenever he died, for those, for, and he stayed in the grave for those two days. It didn't seem like it was good. It didn't seem like this is what God's plan was. But God takes a terrible situation. God can take the least likely situation and turn it and use it for his good. Never doubt the, the, never doubt the power of the Lord despite what it may look like in front of you. Despite how scrawny David looks. Despite the, the, the tragedy that happened on that cross 2,000 years ago. And he was placed in the grave. Everyone saw him go in. Don't, don't doubt the power of the Lord because of what you see right in front of you. God's in the business of confidence in the unlikely odds. <laughs> That's the power of the anointing. That's the power of the anointing. And, and I want to touch on that a little bit today, too, of, 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 of what is this anointing? What is, you know, this is, a, this is a word we hear in church sometimes, or maybe uh, you, you, you've heard some, some weird things about anointing online, and you're like, oh, I would never go to a church that does anointing, and it's, it's, it's powers of Satan, I don't know. There's lots of things that people misunderstand about anointing, and I want to clear it up a little bit. So, you know, when, when David was anointed by Samuel, it was just a symbol. It was just a symbol. And, and what happened was is they, uh, Samuel took a flask of oil, of olive oil, and poured it all over his head. And that is as literal as it sounds. I mean, poured it all over his head. I imagine David had curly hair. So it was like stuck in there all matted and gross. And it's pouring down on, you know, all, of his, all over his clothes and all over his, you know, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And he's just covered in oil. And, and then he has to walk home that day, you know. And in the hot baking sun in the Middle East, you know, he's going he's gonna, to... Um, Oh, what do you do with oil? Pan fry? I don't know. Uh, sear. He's going to sear him. He's going to sear him with the sun. You know, of this olive oil. And he's already dark and handsome, so it's like, well. Eh. But this is, this is what anointing was in, in, the old, in, in, in the Bible times is, you know, sometimes they would take even more than that, six quarts sometimes. Uh, in Exodus, they talk about taking six quarts and dumping it on the, I mean, just drenching them in, in this olive oil. And it was messy in the original contact. And like I said, you'd, you'd have to walk home with that and you'd see your footsteps and it was just a big mess. But that's the point because anointing leaves a mark on you. You couldn't get in the shower. Well, I guess water and oil don't mix. So, I mean, it's really hard to get off even today's standard. And we, they didn't have all the technology they did back in those days either. So anointing leaves a mark, and that, that's kind of the point. And so they would do this for kings and, and people in leadership positions and, and et cetera, et cetera, of, of where they would appoint people. And what it represented was the Holy Spirit. What it represented was the Holy Spirit. So, so as they would pour the oil on you, and that represented the, the Holy Spirit covering you and, and anointing you and protecting you and providing for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it would represent that you were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that's exactly what happened with David. We read that as, as, as Samuel anointed David, he, he then was anointed by the Holy Spirit. So the symbol is just what you can see reflected uh, of what was happening that you could not see. And so as it's, as it's, as it's you know, covering uh, David, the Holy Spirit's covering him and empowering him to do, the thing, to do the things that he would not be able to do without the anointing of God. Because when God places his anointing on you, hear me, he gives you these two things. He gives you the ability to do what he wants you to do, and he gives you the authority to do what he wants you to do. When, when God places his anointing on you, he gives you the ability to do the things he wants you to do, and he gives you the authority to do the things he wants you to do. The, the, the anointing brings forth the authority and the ability, and God lets you do, God enables you to do whatever he calls you to do. He gives you the power and the strength that we can rely on, that we can only attribute back to him because of his anointing on our lives, and, and, and God gives us permission to do it. 
Paul says this, and I, I want to I read this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And, and it, it says this. This is Paul writing. It is God who enables us, ability, God gives us the ability. It's God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us, authority, and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as, the first, as his first installment that guarantees everything that he has promised us. And you remember that when the disciples uh, of Jesus were, when, when, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, he, he, was di- he, he died, he was buried, and then he resurrected, and he was revealing himself to the disciples, and the disciples were like, I don't even know what's going on anymore, you know? And they're just t- trying to, to, to meet up and, and figure out what they're going to try to do. And, and so um, they, they just didn't know what to do. And, and, and Jesus is appearing to them, and he appears to them one time, and, and he says, hey, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So essentially, he's like, hey, stay put. Don't freak out. And, and you'll know when it's time. You'll know when it's time. And shortly after, when the disciples were in the upper room, when, when, when they, were on, on the, they were there on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and they began to speak in other languages, speak in other tongues, and, and to those who were already there, and they were like, well, that's, that's my language. That's the power. That must be the power of God through these people. So, so the, the Holy Spirit filled the place, it filled the people. Tongues of fire came down on the, the disciples. They spoke with the ability and they spoke with the authority that God has given them because these are God's anointed people. When God anoints you, he gives you the power and the permission to accomplish the purpose that he's placed on you. When God anoints you, the Holy Spirit gives you the power and the permission to accomplish the purpose God has for you. You don't get up on a, early on a Sunday morning to come and to, to see some young kid yell at you for 45 minutes to an hour wearing skinny jeans, sweating up here. You don't come because it's fun. You don't come to sing the same songs that you could sing on your own in the car. Or, you know, you, you don't come to sing and it's karaoke and it's fun and, and you don't come for the environment. You don't come for the light show. You, you, don't, you don't come for the atmosphere. You certainly don't come for the air conditioning. You come to have an encounter with Jesus. You come because the, the Holy Spirit has anointed this, this church and our leadership to take what they, they give and, 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 and give power and authority to do something that pierces your heart and mind every single week. We don't come because it's fun. We don't come because we feel like we have to, maybe some of us. We come because we get to encounter the presence of God. Holy Spirit is doing something through the work of his people that he's called to do it. Every word that is spoken is useless and void without the anointing. We are nothing without his presence empowering us to accomplish the assignment he's placed on us. God takes us and and uses, it turns us into something he can use and gives us the power and the authority to do it. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need the, the anointing of, of the Lord. And, and, and what God anoints you to do may come as a shock to you. <laughs> it, it, it might not be what you think it is, like it was David, you know? It, it may come as a shock to you, you know, and we might think, uh, I'm not equipped to do that. I, I'm not able to do that. I'm not prepared to do, I don't have enough experience to do what you're calling me to do, God. I, I, I can't do that. And a lot of us, a lot of us miss out on the miracle working power of God through our lives. We, we say we don't see miracles is because we don't respond to the anointing He's placed in our lives. Is that too mean? It's true though. We, we, we say we don't, I don't, I don't see the miracle, you know, the, the miracles are only in the Bible. It's like, no, the miracles are happening right now around you just not looking for him. You've not responded to God's anointing on your life because you have a bunch of excuses that says, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, and maybe we believe the lies that say such, and I believe that's what Satan wants to do to a lot of Christians and a lot of people in, in power and people with authority is he, 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 can't, he can't control the anointing on your life. He doesn't have that much power. 
but you can by saying no and not responding in the anointing that God has placed on your life. And so if he can attack your confidence, if he can attack your mindset, if he can attack your, your clarity, then he wins. But, but, but God places this anointing on our lives and, and, and we can either come up with a bunch of excuses or say, God, I, I trust you in what you've called me to do. And Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, when I am weak, I am strong through the power of Christ within me. He goes on to say, I, I boast in my weakness. <laughs> what? <laughs> I love when I'm weak because that means that the power of God is gonna do something incredible to make me strong again. And I love Paul's outlook on this. Let me encourage you today. If God calls you to it, he'll enable you to do it. If God calls you to it, he'll enable you to do it. Jesus did not defeat hell, death, and the grave for us to be walking around mopey <laughs> with no power and authority. He gave us power over sin. He gave us authority over sin, not on our own, but through the power of Jesus working within us, through the power of the Holy Spirit working with us, through the anointing on our lives. If God calls you to it, you better believe he'll enable you to do it. And God's anointing, like I said, might not be what you expect, might not be what you anticipate, it might not be what you're good at, it might be, who knows? God's really creative when it comes to person to person. That's why there's no, um, <laughs> there's no blanket statement that works for everybody. But God's anointing might not be what works for you, might not be what you wanna do. But I can tell you this, the only person that can stop your anointing is you by not stepping into it confidently. The only person that can hinder your anointing is you. And I'll never forget, I was complaining to God a while ago. I do this often. It's, it's a good practice. I recommend it. A lot of the time he speaks to me in such ways that I'm just like, all right, and shuts me right up. So complain to God. He wants to be in that part of your life too. But I was complaining to God and I was like, man, pastoring's hard. I just, it's, it's so much. Like, why, why can't you just let me be the worship leader again? Like that was so much easier. That was an easier time in my life. I'm good at that. Like, just let me do that. And it's just, you know, whining to God. I heard him so clearly say, and, and it, was, it was so almost audible, you know? You know when you hear God like that, it's like, did I actually hear your voice? <laughs> of course, we would know. But he says, if you always just did what you were good at, what would you rely on me for? If I placed you in a position that you're gonna be fine in, you're gonna rely more on yourself than you will me. And I need you to rely on me. I need you to trust me. I'm not looking for you to showcase your gift. I love when you lead worship. But no, that season is over. I want to use you in a different way. Trust me on this. And so I'll just be honest with you. I didn't feel equipped to do this. Still sometimes today, I'm just like, ah, I don't know, man. Maybe this isn't cut out for me. Just give you a little glimpse into my own head. And, and the lies that I believe sometimes that come through Facebook messages and emails. That's another story for another time. But, but I, I, from that moment, I was like, you know what, God, I, I am going to trust you with this anointing. Just because we don't want to do it doesn't mean that God changes his mind. He's like, okay, well, all right, you win. You can do, what, you can do whatever you want over here, and I'll, I'll bless that, you know. We trust God's plans for our life. Trust God's anointing on your life. God's gonna use you for such an incredible thing. Like you said to Samuel, God doesn't see things the way that you see things. And I don't wanna be mean, but I do wanna be honest. You'll never be able to confidently step into who, into where God has anointed you if the only time you connect with him is for two hours on a Sunday. That's a tough word to hear. But it's true. If we struggle with confidence with God and, and knowing God and hearing his voice, it's something we become familiar with, something we, we can recognize God's voice over the lies of the enemy because we have heard God's voice so many times, not just once a week on a Sunday. And so I, I don't say that to, to shame anybody, but I say that to encourage you 
that God is not just a box we check off. Jesus is not just a box we check off. This is a relationship. This is a lifestyle. God wants to use you for something great. We have to be committed. We have to be confident. Not just to the anointing. It's not about the, at the end of the day, it's not about the anointing, it's about the relationship. God, Jesus didn't die for us, come and take our, our sin and, and nail it to the cross so we can be powerful, although that's a nice side effect. Ultimately, he came so that we can be with each other. God wants to be with you. Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to have relationship with you, and Jesus made that possible for us. And when we have relationship with him, we can find ways to, to step into more power and authority as he enables us to, to be able to partner with him in building his kingdom. God wants to use you, even your inadequacies, even, even in, your, in your unqualifications, even in your unpreparedness, God wants to use you. So let's, let's partner with him and step confidently into where God has anointed us today. It's different for everybody. Like I said, you may not expect it, you may not anticipate it. It may be your gift where he's gifted you, it may not. But the only way we're gonna know what the, the plan is for our life, and what God wants to use us for is if we're in consistent and deep relationship with him. And he can use us to impact this world in such an incredible way, I'm telling you. And I think we're starting to see the fruit of that in our church too. If God uses the least likely to succeed, to do something great. And I think we can all relate with that. In fact, God, I think you and I are the least likely to even have a relationship with God. In terms of we can't earn it on our own, we're, we're, we're not likely, we're, we're, we have a 0% chance of, of being in a relationship with God except through Jesus. So there's the first instance in where he raised us up to be greater than we can already be by giving us his spirit, giving us his presence that we can have a relationship with each and every single day. God chooses the least likely. He chooses you and he chooses me. So let's step into that today. That's our, that's our challenge. That's what I want to challenge and encourage you with. So let, let's jump up on our feet real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll bless us and I'll pray us out we can get in something with a fan. Whew. Leslie, you look nice and comfortable up there. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> oh, man. You know, wouldn't it be awesome if, if, if our lives were showcases of God's glory? Ooh, that's a good word. Wouldn't it be awesome if our lives were showcases of God's glory, of God's mercy, and of God's grace to those who need it most? those who we're surrounded with, those who God has placed us with, those who we work with, those who we're related with. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome if our, if our lives were a showcase of the glory of God? And we have the opportunity to show people how great and mighty our Father is through the power he gives us and through the authority he gives us and the story he writes in us to share with our peers and everyone around us. Uh, maybe I'm just ambitious, but I think, I think that's a good place to start. All right, let me, I'll stop preaching. I'm sorry. Let me, let me pray over us and, and we'll, we'll get, get going and cool off a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible day. Thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together, this time in your presence, and this time to learn about your word and, and about your, your encounters with, with people and, 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 and saints and heroes of the faith that so, so inspire us to be who we are today. 
God, I, I just pray that your anointing would become more clear as, as time goes on, as we say, you know what, I, I choose you, God. I, I choose to be in relationship with you, not just on Sundays at 10 a.m., but I choose to be in relationship with you every single step of my life. Every day I wake up, I choose you. Every day that I go to bed, I choose you. Let us be a, a, a church. Let us be a generation that just chooses you and step confidently into the anointing that you've placed on our lives to do what you want us to do. Not that you need us for, but that you want us to do. And let us partner proudly with you and boldly with you to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to take your love to the ends of the earth. I pray miracles, signs, and wonders that happens through our lives, through your power that is, that, is, that is enabling us to do this and your anointing on our lives, Jesus. God, I pray for those in the room who don't have a relationship with you, that you would start to divinely inspire them to not leave this place without deciding to choose you and deciding to follow you. And in fact, let me speak to you just for a moment. If that's you, I, I want to encourage you not to leave this place without making that decision because it is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your entire life. I promise you, it's not always easy, but it's so, so good. His love is so good. His love is so rich. His love is so uh, plentiful and bountiful to cover any sin, any, uh, any uh, iniquity that you've been. And you, you may feel like you're not good enough, I promise. While Jesus, Jesus loves us anyways. Jesus loves us, and you can't earn God's love. And he died to take on your sin, to call you the righteousness of God. And it's a free gift today. I, I just want you to know that it's not anything weird or anything that, uh, that's, that's going to, um, it's, it's not anything that's, that's going to harm you or anything that's going to hurt you. It's this free gift we get to accept, the love of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus. I just want to encourage you not to leave this place without choosing Jesus today and having a relationship with him and saying, God, I, I don't know everything about you. Jesus, I don't know everything about you, but you know what? I'm, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to step in your direction today. Even if it's a small step, it, it's just take your next step towards Jesus. And watch how God opens up the doors for you to see him even more clearly. I want to encourage you to, to make that decision this morning before you leave those two doors. God, I just pray that as we step into our, our, uh, step into our calling, step into our anointing, step into the purpose you have for our lives. I just, I just pray you give us boldness too. Don't let us chicken out. <laughs> don't, let us, don't let us give into the lies of the enemy. Don't let us um, give into the lies our, that we tell ourselves. But God, that we stick to your truth. We know your truth. And we know that you can enable us to do whatever daunting task you may give us. But we trust you in it. We're confident in you. We are confident in you. So God, use us, mold us, shape us to who you want us to be. And let us go love this world the way you do. And watch as, as how you empower our lives changes everyone around us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the fact that you want to use us even though you don't have to. You're not required to, but you want to. We're so grateful for this. God, we give you our lives. We give you everything we brought in here today. We just lay it at your feet. I pray that we walk out of these doors completely and utterly changed in Jesus' name. God, we give you our, 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 all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In your mighty name we pray. 
Amen. Amen and amen.